chasing the police every single day. So you guys remember on Friday when we told you about all those crazy and excessive fines being handed out in Dunedin? I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars for not cutting your grass. It sounds crazy, but one Tampa Bay woman is actually living that nightmare because of a dirty pool. Christy Allen is fighting the city of Dunedin after they sued her for more than 100 grand. They're calling it code violations. But as Liz Crawford explains, they started slapping her with fines five years after she moved out. And at first, like, I thought it was a scam. I thought somebody was trying to extort money from me. Christy Allen and her husband Keith live in Palm Harbor. They moved out of this Dunedin home in 2011 after they were forced to foreclose. We kept everything very nice. We never had one code violation while we lived there. They started a new chapter and left Dunedin with nothing but good memories. Or so they thought. Ten months ago, Christy Allen received a letter from the city stating that she had 15 days to pay fines totaling more than $100,000 for code violations that occurred between 2014 and 2016. That's right, years after she moved out. The city cited a poorly maintained pool and lawn. I don't understand why they have me on the hook for the majority of the fees are in someone else's name. The house is in someone else's name. Christy Allen says she was never notified while the fines continued to accumulate. I would not have just let these fees and fines pile up day after day, year after year without doing anything. When Allen didn't pay, the city sued her. She said she was served papers four days before Christmas when her kids were home. This um, lawsuit is financially holding us hostage. I would like to put my son back into private speech therapy that he desperately needs. Um, my daughter wants to go back into gymnastics right now. I mean, there are a number of things that we need that we just can't, we can't afford. It all seems so confusing. Uh, the Dunedin City Attorney told us they actually sent the required legal notices to Christie based on the address that was listed in the tax collector's office. He also said the law allows the city to find the person who owned the property at the time the fines occurred. They can continue to find that person until the property is up to code. So you guys remember on Friday when we told you about all those crazy and excessive fines being handed out in Dunedin? I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars for not cutting your grass. It sounds crazy, but one Tampa Bay woman is actually living that nightmare because of a dirty pool. Christy Allen is fighting the city of Dunedin after they sued her for more than 100 grand. They're calling it code violations. But as Liz Crawford explains, they started slapping her with fines five years after she moved out. And at first, like, I thought it was a scam. I thought somebody was trying to extort money from me. Christy Allen and her husband Keith live in Palm Harbor. They moved out of this Dunedin home in 2011 after they were forced to foreclose. We kept everything very nice. We never had one code violation while we lived there. They started a new chapter and left Dunedin with nothing but good memories, or so they thought. Ten months ago, Christy Allen received a letter from the city stating that she had 15 days to pay fines totaling more than $100,000 for code violations that occurred between 2014 and 2016. That's right, years after she moved out. The city cited a poorly maintained pool and lawn. I don't understand why they have me on the hook for the majority of the fees are in someone else's name. The house is in someone else's name. Christy Allen says she was never notified while the fines continued to accumulate. I would not have just let these fees and fines pile up day after day, year after year, without doing anything. When Allen didn't pay, the city sued her. She said she was served papers four days before Christmas when her kids were home. This um, lawsuit is financially holding us hostage. I would like to put my son back into private speech therapy that he desperately needs. Um, my daughter wants to go back into gymnastics right now. I mean, there are a number of things that we need that we just can't, we can't afford. It all seems so confusing. Uh, the Dunedin City Attorney told us they actually sent the required legal notices to Christie based on the address that was listed in the tax collector's office. He also said the law allows the city to find the person who owned the property at the time the fines occurred. They can continue to find that person until the property is up to code. So you guys remember on Friday when we told you about all those crazy and excessive fines being handed out in Dunedin? I mean, 
hundreds of thousands of dollars for not cutting your grass. It sounds crazy, but one Tampa Bay woman is actually living that nightmare because of a dirty pool. Christy Allen is fighting the city of Dunedin after they sued her for more than 100 grand. They're calling it code violations. But as Liz Crawford explains, they started slapping her with fines five years after she moved out. And at first, like, I thought it was a scam. I thought somebody was trying to extort money from me. Christy Allen and her husband Keith live in Palm Harbor. They moved out of this Dunedin home in 2011 after they were forced to foreclose. We kept everything very nice. We never had one code violation while we lived there. They started a new chapter and left Dunedin with nothing but good memories, or so they thought. Ten months ago, Christy Allen received a letter from the city stating that she had 15 days to pay fines totaling more than $100,000 for code violations that occurred between 2014 and 2016. That's right, years after she moved out. The city cited a poorly maintained pool and lawn. I don't understand why they have me on the hook for the majority of the fees are in someone else's name. The house is in someone else's name. Christy Allen says she was never notified while the fines continued to accumulate. I would not have just let these fees and fines pile up day after day, year after year without doing anything. When Allen didn't pay, the city sued her. She said she was surf papers four days before Christmas when her kids were home. This um, lawsuit is financially holding us hostage. I would like to put my son back into private speech therapy that he desperately needs. Um, my daughter wants to go back into gymnastics right now. I mean, there are a number of things that we need that we just can't, we can't afford. It all seems so confusing. Uh, the Dunedin City Attorney told us they actually sent the required legal notices to Christie based on the address that was listed in the tax collector's office. He also said the law allows the city to find the person who owned the property at the time the fines occurred. They can continue to find that person until the property is up to code. It was a great starter home, you know, a first home. Perfect for us. Just off the Pinellas Trail in Dunedin sits Christy Allen's first home, the one she loved and lost during the recession, moving out in 2011 after the bank foreclosed. It was hard to lose our home. I brought my son home from the hospital to that house. It was very difficult for us. But years later, Allen still can't put the ordeal behind her after receiving notice from the city that she owes more than $100,000 in fines for overgrown property in a stagnant pool imposed long after she moved out. At first, I thought it was a scam. Somebody was trying to extort money from me. I don't know how we would ever be able to pay that back. Allen's story actually made national headlines last week when it appeared in a USA Today article. What we didn't see was much about the city side of things. So we stopped by City Hall here for some answers and were surprised to learn about some massive backlash. Hey, Jennifer Bramley is a real piece of it's just one of hundreds of voicemails city manager Jennifer Bramley says officials have received since the story broke, and that's not all. I have a sheriff's uh, deputy station in the code enforcement office right now. We've received death threats, we've received obscene emails, and obscene phone calls. All angry with the city for what's happening to Allen. Despite the foul language, Bramley says she gets it. Allen is in a tough place and people sympathize. But Bramley says the city must go by what the county tax collector's records say. So even though Allen says she moved out in 2011, she was still listed as the homeowner in 2014 when the fines started to accrue. Bramley also points out Dunedin isn't the only city cracking down on homes in disrepair. It's 100% the aftermath of the recession, and it's happening in every city in Florida. For some reason, the narrative has landed in delightful Dunedin, which I don't think is necessarily fair. But, says Allen, neither is what's happening to her. I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do. Okay, I, I played it by the book. And now Allen says she's on the hook for a home that's not even hers. In Dunedin, Kate McVeigh, Spectrum, Bay News 9. Right. When we're talking 25,000.
Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Wendy Ryan in for Paul this half hour. The city of Dunedin hiring a crisis PR firm after coming under fire from the public for foreclosing on a homeowner who could not pay a fine for this tall grass. I-team investigator Kylie McGivern uncovers the new PR manager costing taxpayers $25,000 for just one month. She went to City Hall to get some answers about this new hire. My name is Kylie. I'm a reporter with hey ABC there. Action News. The I team working to get answers after Dunedin hired this man, Ron Sachs, the CEO of a crisis PR firm. We tracked down the city spokesperson, Courtney King. We would right. like to talk with someone from the city about why he was hired to begin with. Right. When we're talking $25,000 for a one month contract. Right. She's not going to be giving any comments. She is out today. So. That's all I can say. Could we speak with you about it? Um, no, I'm not, gonna, I, I'm not going to speak about, about it. City manager Jennifer Bramley wouldn't give an interview about the $25,000 PR contract. That contract signed May 24th, more than two weeks after ABC Action News first reported a homeowner is facing foreclosure for failing to pay code enforcement fines. And the inspector comes by and says, you're going to get a big bill from the city. The homeowner in the foreclosure case says he was out of state for a family emergency when his landscaper died and has filed a lawsuit against the city. But Dunedin taxpayer Robin Anderson was surprised to learn about the new PR hire. Can't imagine what they'd be doing for a one month contract for that large sum. That's quite a bit. City leaders directed us to Sachs for answers. To help them message most effectively the facts and the truth because some news organizations are not fully and fairly reporting this story. He wouldn't give details about the specific work he's done for the city, but the I-team found Sachs wrote this statement posted to Dunedin's website on the same day he was hired, claiming the city has faced unfair criticism for foreclosing for an unpaid $30,000 fine for high grass. Sachs says he's defending the city's position. Chronic scofflaw who ignores code enforcement uh, notifications and has enjoyed being a scofflaw, being a bad neighbor who doesn't even live in the home in question. But the attorney for the homeowner, Ari Bargill, disagrees. This is a really trivial violation. It's an astronomical amount of money for anybody. And the ultimate consequence, the foreclosure of somebody's home, is something that we see only in really rare instances. The I-team found in the last five years, Dunedin code enforcement fines nearly tripled, with more than a million dollars collected just last year. No one from the city would go on camera, but the city's full-time spokesperson emailed the I-team a statement saying their crisis PR firm is helping the city develop communication strategies and, quote, respond in a transparent way. I'm I-team investigator Kylie McGivern taking action for you. And we started looking into this story because of a tip to our I-team. If you have something you'd like our I-team to investigate, you can email I-team at abcactionnews.com or call us at 866-428-NEWS. All new at six. The hepatitis. Okay. All right. So you ladies, I know you've done this before, so you can just look at me and, like I said, more of a conversation than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but I will kind of start by sticking to most of my questions here. Um, as you know, the media, not just us or even local media, but national media, has run quite a bit of um, stories regarding Dunedin's excessive fining and the code enforcement. What has been the response that you've gotten from people living in Dunedin? Um, well, Liz, actually we've gotten quite a bit of support from Dunedin residents because they know who we are as a city. We are um, a, a compassionate city that cares about our residents, so we've gotten quite a bit of support. So have people actually like called City Hall or sent emails and that kind of thing? Yes, they have. They have social media, um, phone calls, texts, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. In regards to the reputation of Dunedin, you know, as far as I know, you know, it's kind of known as a, a beach town, local town, mm -hmm. community driven. Um, are you worried about the reputation in any way, given some of the, the reports in the national media and the, the negative attention? I couldn't say no to that. Of course I'm worried. We're, we're all worried about it. But what we're most focused on are our residents, because that's who we work for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so let me kind of get into some of the specifics with this code enforcement. Um, you know, point blank, do you think that it is extreme that high grass or uncut lawn could lead to someone losing their home? Um, well, the answer is yes. Um, I think that that's why we work with our residents to reduce those codes. 
every day. We, we are constantly reducing those fines once they're in compliance. I think it's important to add that by Florida statute uh, and city policy, we do not foreclose on homesteaded property, which means if it's their primary home, we will not foreclose on the property. So in regards to the case involving Jim Ficken, um, you know, he's been fined $30,000, um, and now he's looking at potential foreclosure. On um, that property. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do, how do you explain that? That property is not his homesteaded property. He owns at least five other properties in Pinellas County. His homesteaded property is in Clearwater. That's mm -hmm. his primary residence. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, since we brought up Jim Ficken, um, I do want to ask you, you know, his, his circumstance, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but he had hired someone to cut his lawn while he was out of town. That person um, suddenly died. He was handling his dead mother's estate out of state. Um, so when you consider all of that, um, do you think that there could be some kind of um, pass or some kind of appeal that he could sign up for? Or is there any, any route he could take other than what he's being faced with? Yes, there was another route. And that was um, you know, working with our city to come into compliance and to get a fine reduction. So when you're looking at a $30,000 fine, because $500 a day adds up pretty quickly, what would be a fine reduction that he could have gotten? It, it's all situational. I, I don't want to speculate. Mm -hmm. um, it really is all situational, depending on the situation. Is there any way that the city could have just cut his lawn and then sent him a bill? I think what we need to really bring the conversation back to is that Every single code violation that happens in any city is all very situational. It's all different, and I think that um, we are uh, our codes, our code policies and procedures are probably decades old, as most cities are. Um, and I think it's important for us to step back and take a look at what those policies and procedures are, and try to build in some more flexibility. So, um, you know, being that you kind of brought that up. Why, why is Dunedin so aggressive in these code enforcement fines? And see, and I don't think we are aggressive in code enforcement. We are complaint driven. Okay. Um, so our neighbors of various derelict homes or homes that are problematic are the ones calling and asking us to go out and take a look at something. So you don't go out and search for people no, that are in violation? This we is, do not. This is neighbors. These are neighbors calling on these homes. So we have an obligation to um, not only uh, deal with the person who is violating, but uh, to protect those that live next to them and on their street and in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to note as well that if the property owner is working uh, with the Code Enforcement Division, then they will be given liberal, liberal leeway to bring it to compliance. As long as we can see that, process, that, that progress is being made, we'll grant extension after extension until they come into compliance. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want you to reiterate kind of what you said, Mayor, just to clarify. So you're willing and you're kind of saying that maybe the code enforcement policies do need to be looked at again. Absolutely. You don't go through something like this as a community uh, and as good leaders and not take a step back and look at what's going on in your community and, and, and asking yourself the question, what can we do better? And that's exactly what we're going to do. When do you think that's something that you could actually turn around and could be tangible and then, you know, absorbed by your citizens? Um, I, you know, I think in the next few months, you know, everything, everything takes time in government, as you know. But yeah, I think over the next few months, we're going to sit down and, and really look at um, how we can be flexible, how we can empower um, our code enforcement officers um, and our decision makers um, today. Um, My mind drifted somewhere else. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, speaking of your code enforcement officers, who is in charge of that program? Um, well, ultimately, it is our code board, which is a citizen-led code board, mm -hmm. and our city attorney. Do you have like a code enforcement director or something like that? Um, I, you know, I'm not going to talk about our employees okay. because you know they're following the regulations that they have that that are set by most of them set by law, mm -hmm. and they're pretty black and white. And I think that's where we want to look and try to find where the flexibility needs to be. 
I had received information that the code enforcement director, and I don't know if I have the right title, was recently fired. Can you confirm that? Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about our employees, but it. I can confirm that that no code enforcement officer officer has been terminated. Okay. In the last three or four years. Um, how does currently, and I know you're willing to look at things, and this could all change in the next couple months. Sure. But how does the city notify folks that they are in violation? Well, the uh, code officer, if it's residential, will will go to the property. If there's a violation, there's going to be a courtesy notice issued first. And the courtesy notice is, is usually, did you realize that, you know, X, Y, Z is, is a violation? And then the code officer will give them a, a period of time to come into compliance. We'll revisit the site. If it's not in compliance, then there is a, a, um, a hearing date set. And then you go to the code enforcement board. We send it uh, registered mail, return receipt requested, which is actually uh, more than we have to do. If that is not signed for, and sometimes it's not, sometimes a property owner won't sign for it, then we post the property. There's a, there's a message that we put on that so there's a code violation and notice of public hearing. When you say you post it, like at the property? Yes. Okay. So um, that kind of leads me to the um, the woman, Christy Allen. So she foreclosed, I, I, you're probably familiar with her because the yes. national media has covered her yes. as well. She foreclosed on her home in 2011 and moved out. Um, and then, you know, she had been out of there for quite some time. And the city sent notifications to that property starting in 2014, long after she had left. So the notification was being sent to a property, not a person. Correct. So how do you explain that? The notification was sent to the property owner of record in the tax collector's office, and that's required by Florida statute and our code of ordinances. Wasn't there a red flag when they continued to be sent back and that it was obvious that it wasn't reaching the person that was seemingly responsible? The, and uh, oftentimes they are sent back because oftentimes the property owner just won't sign for them. Um, the, um, it, it is an indication, but there's no other avenue absent a good lead uh, for contacting that person, for reaching out and contacting that person. Now, to that, I will ask this. Mm -hmm. So Christy Allen foreclosed on her home in 2011. Yes. She was still responsible for utilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess this happens in foreclosure cases sometimes where you're still on the hook for some of those utilities with the city. Yes. And she got a bill at the correct and current address for those utility bills that yes. she continued to pay. Yes. So somebody in the city had the right address, the current address, and reached her and got money from her. Yes. Is this a mix-up? I mean, how do you explain that? That's not a mix-up. Um, the code enforcement officer, when they're on site, wouldn't necessarily know where the property owner went if they're not on the property or even if they're in the state. So I don't think it, they would necessarily know to look to, to utilities um, that, that to, in order to find a different address to send to her. Uh, if she had moved out of state, there wouldn't be any other address for it. So there's really no knowledge of the fact that she was still even in the vicinity at that point. Mm -hmm. But I will say, again, as I said earlier, um, I think to... Um, you know, at that time in 2014, mm -hmm. there was a like a glut from the recession of bank-owned properties. Although in this particular case, we didn't know it was bank-owned because the bank apparently never changed the property appraiser's records. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we wouldn't even have known a that she didn't live there and b that she um, uh, had foreclosed or given it back. Okay, but I also want to say that there was a glut of these kinds of properties all over the city. And so, um, it's not an excuse, and, and I also, but, it, but it's the truth. It really is the truth. There was a ton. And so, our code folks could barely keep up. You're not required by law to go, do, to go search in another way. You're required by law to go to the property um, mm -hmm. appraisers. But having said that, again, this is where I feel, and I think our commission feels, and I would say that Jennifer feels, that these are the kinds of things that, that we need to be looking at, that we need to find um, flexible ways of figuring things out. And we need to empower our employees and, and folks that are dealing with this stuff every day to, you know, not everything is black and white because every situation is, is different. Um, and again, I, I want to repeat, Dunedin is a community-driven city and I just feel like it's really important for us to to be flexible and to try to look at things for what they are at that moment, not that it's a checked box and um, 
you know, a black and white situation because we're all different mm -hmm. as human beings. Mm -hmm. And now that you have all this information, like you yes. said, you didn't know it at the time, but now no. you have all the facts, you know, and you, as far as Christy Allen's case is concerned, um, you know, and now there's a lawsuit, you know, that mm -hmm. the city's suing her for $103,000. I mean, is no, that... No, the city's not suing her. She's suing us. Okay. Um, she said that she was served papers. She, it's a demand letter. Right. It's okay. a demand letter. It is not a lawsuit in any way. It's a demand letter for that amount. And generally what happens when that demand letter comes back is, you know, or when that demand letter gets received, and it did, she, her attorney, contacted our attorney. Mm -hmm. And th that's what happens. So it's not a suit, mm -hmm. um, but she is now suing us. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you're gonna, if you're gonna ask about, you know, what we're gonna do, we can't answer that. Because it's there's ongoing because there's litigation. Ongoing, yeah. mm -hmm. There have been uh, two settlement offers uh, afforded by our attorney, mm -hmm. uh, and neither one of those attempts have been successful uh, through her attorney. And that's the same with, you know, Mr. Fricken. Mm -hmm. There, there was many discussions with he and our attorney of trying to come up with a settlement, and, and a fine reduction, and and that you know, that just couldn't be worked out. Can you elaborate on what any of the, the dollar amounts on any no. of those settlements or even a ballpark? No, because they're both, they're both litigation now against us. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll pretty much wrap up with Christy Allen's case. And this is a more general question, but hers is the example that I have. Yeah. So she foreclosed in 2011, she moved out. But it wasn't all finalized till 2014, which is pretty typical in foreclosures. It takes a while. But then somebody else did buy that home and a new property owner took over, their name was changed sometime in 2015. 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for some of the time that the fines continued to pile up, her name was not on the property any longer. So is that something that needs to be looked at or is that, you know, but she's still on the hook for times when somebody else in all facets owned the home. But so that's by statute. That's by statute. It's based on, on compliance too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what does that mean? The property wasn't brought up into compliance. And that's, you go ahead with that. So, I interjected so, where I should So that's all right. Two issues to that point. The uh, Florida statutes require that when a lien is recorded in the public records and the bank is foreclosed, then the liens against the bank then are, are non-enforceable. But they attach automatically to the property owner, either their personal or their, or their um, tangible property, and follow them. Um, uh, and that's, that's statewide in Florida. It's required by statute. So the issue is, although she was no longer the property owner of record, that those liens have been attached to her by name. And it follows her. Yes. So uncut lawn in a dirty pool follows her, even if she doesn't own that lawn or pool. Once it has been recorded thereafter, until compliance. This property was found in compliance actually in, in um, 2018, and the notice of compliance uh, was issued in 2016 when the, the building was rehabbed. So it's, it, the timeline is, is interesting, most certainly in this case, but those fines did follow her for a period of time, yes. And you also have to understand in her case, um, again, what you just heard was following everything to the letter of the law, mm -hmm. okay? And that's where we're looking for flexibility. Uh, but having said that, in her case, it was the neighbors complaining about the black pool. Their words in their complaint was they thought something was dead. And black pools are a life safety issue. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know it's not like, okay, dirty pool. I mean, my pool gets green with all the rain every other week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to fight that battle. This is not that. This is, this is a life safety issue. Can you get into the fence? Can, can kids get in there? So it's, it's treated on a, on a much different level than grass. Okay, so I just, I, for your own edification, mm -hmm. I want you to understand that. Mm -hmm. But again, back to what Jennifer is saying, who has overseen, you know, she's new. So she's coming into all of this, trying to figure out from 30 previous years of, of, of helping to oversee code enforcement what we can do better. And I'm, I'm really confident that she will help us be able to do that. But the black and white thing is what's, what we need to be able to work around. Mm -hmm. Everything we've done has been by the law. Mm -hmm. We're not doing anything different than any other city. Mm -hmm. I just read 
um, an article recently that a neighboring city has $10 million in fines on the books. Mm -hmm. I also just read where a neighboring city's got 25 foreclosures. We're not doing anything differently. But that doesn't mean that that's, we're known as being delightful Dunedin. So that doesn't mean that you know, our relationship with our residents um, couldn't be different and that we couldn't do better. And we could do better and we should do better. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm glad that you brought that up about the pool because, I mean, that does give people a better understanding. Um, but even uncut grass, the, the fine's 500 bucks a day. Isn't that, is that excessive? And, and see, here's what happens with that. Again, I'm just going to explain it to you. The state sets the, the, the fines, okay? And it's up to 250 for a first offense. It's up to 500 a day for a, a repeat offender. Those fines don't look at what the violation is. It looks at, are you a first-time offender or a, or a multiple offender? Um, and so the code board looks at it the same way. They're not necessarily always looking at what the thing is versus, okay, and, and again, if you talk to any other code board, it, they all operate the same. doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's legal. And this is, this is how they operate. Um, so, yeah, the code board saw a repeat offender and said $500 a day. They did not consider what the offense was. Or the circumstances. Yes. So I, that's, again, that's where the flexibility comes in. That's where, um, you know, decades-old policies and procedures, these black and white um, state laws, I mean, there's flexibility in those, in those fines for sure. Mm -hmm. um, that's where our city needs to sit down and say, doesn't matter that everybody's doing it the same way. How do we want to do it? And w what relationship do we want with our community? And again, it's about balance between the violator and the people that live around them. Mm -hmm. Because they have a stake and they have property rights equally. Mm -hmm. um, I will ask you this. Um, I had received information. I can't remember who it was. Somebody here, somebody with the city gave me this information earlier in the week. In 2008, the city collected like $49,000 in all of tax code violations. 2018, the city made one, almost $1.2 million yeah. off of yeah. fines. Mm -hmm. So that just is so glaring. How do you explain that difference? So during the recession, uh, the bank owned properties. Uh, the banks foreclosed on the properties. The banks then did not maintain the properties. And that was when yep. we heard you know, all about the abandoned derelict properties. Uh, and there are multiple complaints from the adjacent, you know, uh, from the neighbors. Those bank-owned properties lay derelict essentially for years, and code would issue the notice of violation, the fines would rack up. In order to get it back on the property, the bank needed to settle with the city as far as those fines go, um, and they did. And so those, we figure probably about 70% of those fines that we've collected were bank-owned properties that had been foreclosed. Throughout the off. session. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There, were th there were literally hundreds of them. And I, and I will tell you this, and the mayor has said it before, I did work for two other cities before I came here over a 30-year career, career, and it's the same in those cities. The same if you look at all the other cities. There was a glut on the market. The fines were paid off. We're anticipating next year that we're going to have about four hundred thousand dollars. Because you're not going to have all the, the banks right. and all those settlements. They're it just took so long. That that's why you saw that arc. Yeah. So seventy percent of them, you held the bank responsible. Okay. Right. But for the rest, if if it's foreclosed homes, you know, you might be looking at a lot of people like Christy Allen, where they kind of reached rock bottom. They had to foreclose on their home. Mm -hmm. Then years have gone by. They're probably back on their feet, and now they're being kind of stunned with some of these so violations? I don't think that's accurate because I don't think all those fines that are in there are all foreclosures. Mm -hmm. I mean, people right. settle their fine. I mean, we're a city of, let's say, permanent residents, 35,000. I'm, I'm just using it. It could be 38. It depends. It changes all the time. So let's say 35,000. We've got about 1% of those um, 35,000 that are, you know, code violators. Um, and it could it could be multiple things of you know five hundred dollar fee. It could be a ten thousand dollar fee. So that other thirty percent is not all foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So it it can't be characterized that mm -hmm. way. But I don't think all of the foreclosures can be characterized as being paid off by the bank either, because in Christie's case, no, no, and it that's wasn't why, an individual. Correct, and that's that's why she 
said about 70%. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the way you characterized it as the other 30%, I'm saying those are not all foreclosures. Yeah. So let me then ask you this. For the foreclosures that we're talking about, because that's what you're blaming this huge swing on, that's the reason. In the cases where the bank did not own the property, and again, foreclosures took such a long time that it took a while to get names off property. It was such a lengthy process because everybody, especially in this state, was inundated with these foreclosures. So in the instances where the bank didn't get the name on it and they weren't the, uh, you know, things took a while to get finalized and it was on the, that, on an individual, um, does it seem fair to be holding someone who had to foreclose on their home, hit rock bottom, and now to hold them accountable for the lawn years later? So in that instance, what would happen is that the, the uh, person that is subject to the fine would go before the Code Enforcement Board and ask for a reduction. We would take all of those circumstances, all of, all of you know, everything that had happened, the paperwork, and, and show the timeline. And then the, the Code Enforcement Board would uh, essentially um, issue a settlement, a settlement agreement that would eventually be approved by the City Commission. They, they approved two last Tuesday. And that's all works as long as that person's notified and responds. Yes. Well, typically, yes. the, this person would approach the city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. But they would have been notified of the violations. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you really covered it, Mayor, in terms of, you know, is the city willing to make adaptations and flexibility? We are. Mm -hmm. We are, because here's the, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, when you know better, you do better, as Oprah would say. Um, and it, I don't think any of us uh, understood what was happening. We are not involved in that decision making, okay? And that's really important to say. Um, our code enforcement board and our legal team handles those things, and it's like that in every other city. The elected officials are not involved. What the elected officials do do, though, is set policy. And we can say that, you know, our policy needs to be flexible. Our policy needs to work with our residents um, and while addressing the bad actors, if, if you will, because there's always going to be some. Um, and we have to have a flexible way of doing that in a way that, that benefits um, our community. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I think that you um, pretty much covered it. Um, mm. Is there anything else that you want to add that I did not ask you? I mean, for the record, let, let me just ask you this. Has, has the city of Dunedin in the last several years been going out of their way to find people for violations that they see in order to make a profit? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Our code enforcement is for compliance, not punishment, not to make money and it's complaint-based. So we are not out driving around looking for, um, you know, problems, so. If that were the case, then we would budget 1.3 million this year in, in fine as well. But we have not, because the bank-owned properties are going off market, and we're reducing our estimates for fines. So fines do make it into a budget? They do. They make it in the general fund. But it's, you're not just talking about code enforcement fines. There's a, there's a pot of money that is permitting fees. I mean, it all is in one pot. Okay. Okay? And so don't forget, development countywide is, mm -hmm. you know, people are remodeling their homes now where they weren't doing that 10 years ago. So all of that is one big pot. Mm -hmm. So it's not just code enforcement fines. Sure. Okay. Um, like I said, is there anything else that the two of you can think about? Um, or anything that you want to address? I know you talked about there is an appeal process, there is a way to kind of show up, you know, meet and meet with the board and find, reach a settlement, reach a compromise. That's already in place. I, I think here's what we want our community to know, that this commission um, and our city manager and our, our department heads and our staff have looked at this situation and said um, it's important to examine how we do things and that to provide flexibility, and if there are improvements that can be made, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis and then fully understand the circumstances and the people behind some of this? 
Yes, we are. And that's the flexibility I'm talking about and being able to empower the, the decision makers that are going through this to, to be able to do that. I think they do to a, great, to a degree. It's not that I don't think they're already doing that, but absolutely. That's the flexibility I'm talking about. Great. I think you covered it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Hey, Sheriff County. This is Sheriff County Cop Watch. I am using any video here with under fair use. If you uh, have criticism, reporting, teaching, etc., and please donate. I do not make money from YouTube, and uh, there are different ways to donate in the uh, video links. Thanks.